kind of a unique feature, uh, isn't it, when you when you get to, to meet people in that way? Sometimes our elected officials become so idealized by people of like, oh, well, I see them on TV or all I hear about them is something negative from mainstream media or they didn't vote the way that it, but when you have a chance to meet with them in person and you break down some of those barriers that, you know, you might have cast judgment on them because of something that you heard on the news and then you meet them in person and you're like, oh, they are just like me. They're the neighbor next door. They are the person who is, you know, owns their local business and they decided to make a difference and run for office. I remember the first time I approached an elected official here about sponsoring a bill for us, I was so nervous about it. There's this artificial barrier I think that we put up when someone becomes an elected official um, that gives us a sense that like we can't approach them when honestly like they are there to work for us, represent us, and so we should feel like we can approach them. Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Hey, thanks for being with us for another episode of American Potential. We've been talking about all kinds of presidential states and presidential primaries. Well, South Carolina, you know, it's known for its history, its good food, and its southern hospitality. But it's also known for being the first southern state to vote in the presidential primary. Now, since 1980, South Carolina has held the title of first in the South primary, which has allowed the state to play a very significant role in shaping the political landscape. Now, the first ever presidential primary in South Carolina was held by the Republican Party, and the candidates were Governor John Connolly of Texas and Governor Ronald Reagan of California. Well, Ronald Reagan went on to win the Republican nomination and then won the presidency against President Jimmy Carter. The South Carolina primary provides candidates the chance to engage with voters on a personal level in town halls, community events, small gatherings, or even by simply grabbing something to eat. Now, today's guest we've had on before to talk a little about what it's like to live and work in South Carolina during a presidential primary season. But we wanted to go a little more in depth. So I want to welcome back Candace Carroll, who is Americans for Prosperity, South Carolina's state director. Welcome. How are you, Candace? Good, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing great. Always great to to see you and to have you uh, on the podcast. Uh, First of all, I didn't know this. I just found this out about you. You ran the Baltimore Marathon twice. When you lived in Washington, D.C. You're kidding. I did. No, no. So, yeah, I lived in D.C. from 2010 to 2014. And that was something that I had set out to accomplish while I was there. Um, So it was a fun time. And I think about the training for that for a marathon of all the endurance that it takes, the speed work, the being in the gym early, all of that. And try to use that same mindset for what we're, we've we been engaging now in the presidential primary in South <laughs> Carolina, because for us, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. We, our team has been working hard since March here and candidates have been in, in and out of the state all year and that will continue. So I think about that mindset a lot and all that goes into that and really all that our team is putting forth right now on the ground too. Well, listen, I, I have never had the desire to run a marathon. <laughs> the only time I run is like if I have to run from a bear or something like that. Or, you know, if I have to do it, I do it. I'm not one of these people that's self-motivated to do it. So you have uh, all of my respect for <laughs> for doing that. And you knocked 30 minutes off your time in between the two, I understand. I did. Two marathons. I did. Yeah. So I worked with a good friend of mine was a trainer that I worked with um, from year to year. And, you know, the Baltimore Marathon is so fun. It goes to the zoo, goes around the harbor. So it's a great um, opportunity, a great venue. If you ever get that desire, Jeff, and and, uh, have that bug bite you, I would recommend it for sure. Uh, But yeah, it was it was kind of a personal challenge of mine of, okay, if I'm going to put myself and my body through that again, let's at least have some reward on the other side of trying to knock some time off of that. So um, it was a great, great accomplishment. I haven't done it since then. I would love to get back into it. But you know, life and kids and all of the things start to take over at some point and for all the training hours that are required. 
All right. Now I'll think about it. Now I'm going to offer the same thing to you. If you ever get the desire to be chased by a bear, you let me know and I'll <laughs> arrange will. that I for will. you. Sound good? It sounds great. <laughs> okay. All right. So what? Let's talk about South Carolina and and what you know. We've talked to uh, to folks from Iowa. We've talked about New Hampshire, Iowa being a caucus state, New Hampshire being a primary state. What makes South Carolina unique compared to Iowa and New Hampshire? Well, as you mentioned, since 1980, we have been the first in the South primary state. But on top of that, South Carolina is known for picking whoever becomes the eventual nominee for the for the party. Only once has someone become the party nominee that was not did not win South Carolina. So there's a lot of pressure here, I think, for candidates. It becomes the make or break state. For a lot of candidates. And that happens on for both political parties, not just on the Republican side, but we saw um, the Congressman Clyburn gave Joe Biden a big bop um, in the previous election. So that's something, a state that both parties really pay heavy attention into what is happening in South Carolina. And our culture is very much a hand, I would consider it like a handshake culture in that you know, if you shake someone's hand and say, hey, I'm going to do this, then people hold you to that and they expect for you to do that. So if you see candidates out on the campaign trail and they're talking about what they're going to do on school choice or healthcare, a variety of things, whether it's at a town hall or a small gathering um, or sometimes a large rally. And, you know, they're, they verbally commit to doing something, then constituents here will hold them accountable to that. Um, So that part, I think, is really interesting and unique. And there's a lot of venues here where you can walk into the restaurant and just see walls of pictures of previous presidential candidates that have come through there. There's certain stops that if you don't hit that stop as a candidate, like you might it's game over for you. It doesn't matter um, because you didn't come to that little local, you know, burger place um, in Spartanburg, for example. So, you know, thinking through those opportunities and and this election, I would say, is even more so unique because we have one of our own running, previously two of our own running until just recently. So that has been an interesting um, perspective for a lot of our folks who, you know, liked both candidates for a variety of reasons. They've both held multiple offices here. So having that hometown representation has meant a lot to people. Yeah, I was going to, that was kind of going to be my next question. You, you just kind of covered it a little bit, but um, what is it like? I mean, you've got, uh, you know, you've got Nikki Haley, who's a former governor of the state of South Carolina. You had Tim Scott in the race up mm-hmm. until recently. Um, you know, more more than one candidate from a state. I mean, most states in America are kind of lucky if they have one person from their state running uh, for president of the United States. But that's kind of unique, isn't it? It is absolutely unique. And having that opportunity to where, you know, they were both in the state legislature previously, so people saw them there. They saw Governor Haley um, and and all that she did when she was governor, how she brought the state together when we had some mass shootings here. Um, People have leaned into that, leaned into the foreign policy experience when she had when she was ambassador. For Senator Scott, he is has always been very well liked um, among constituents all across the state of South Carolina. So having that opportunity. And there were a lot of people who said, man, I just can't decide between the two or I'm going to go with the South Carolinian as long as there's a South Carolinian in the race. Um, And when Senator Scott first became senator, he was appointed into that seat um, by Nikki Haley when she was governor. So there's that history between the two of them where they had previously worked together in the state legislature and then she had appointed him to that Senate seat. So having that opportunity, they are they both live in the same general area of the state down in the low country in Charleston. So they both had to appeal previously to the entirety of the state um, to get elected here into their respective seats as senator and governor. And then now, of course, trying to appeal to the entire country. So having that opportunity, I think it's that name recognition. But for some folks in South Carolina, they're like, OK, I already know what they've done. I already know what they've accomplished, things I like, things I don't like. I want to look at someone outside of the state because maybe I didn't like what they did. And I want to keep my options open. So there's that side of it, too. I think when you've got a candidate running from your home state, constituents understand and see both the good and the bad. And sometimes it's which one outweighs the other as to whether candidates want to consider someone from their home state um, and rally behind them or or start to look elsewhere. It's interesting that you mentioned that history, which I had actually forgotten that uh, Nikki Haley as governor had appointed Tim Scott to fill the vacancy Which makes it all the more interesting. I was uh, in the audience at this last presidential debate and watching, 
And I mean, it kind of surprising. There was a little bit of fireworks back and forth between Tim Scott and Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. Does that, I mean, you know, the backstory better than anyone. What, what, what'd you think of all of that? It wasn't overly surprising to me, but I think for some South, and I think a lot of South Carolinians wasn't overly surprising. They're going to go back and forth with each other because they both wanted, especially when he was still in the race, to win their home state, right? Um, but for others, it was a little bit of a turnoff of when they, especially when they're going back and forth about the curtains when she was ambassador, people were like, okay, can we like have this conversation behind closed doors and actually keep <laughs> policy focused. So, so there's some of that, right? Where when you've got two running from the home state and they know everything about each other, it's, you know, you don't want to air someone's, you know, grievances necessarily on a national stage, but then at the same time, the rest of the country doesn't know some of those things. And so, you know, leaning into those opportunities. So, so there's both people who were applauding and cringing at the same time at the debate watch party that we were hosting around some of those fireworks. Yeah, you, you also mentioned the importance of South Carolina and you pointed out, you know, Joe Biden. I mean, I look at the Democrat mm -hmm. primary just four years ago and nobody knew what was going to happen. Right. They were just, uh, you know, you had Bernie Sanders in the race and several other folks. And and it was not appearing like Joe Biden was doing very well. And then it seemed like the Democrat Party kind of came together and basically uh, Jim Clyburn uh, came out. Uh, and and endorsed uh, endorsed Joe Biden, and he ended up that that ended up sewing up South Carolina, as I recall, for him, and and that really changed the race and the dynamic of the race. Yeah, it did absolutely. And, and Congressman Clyburn, he hasn't endorsed in a lot of presidential races, so to come out for Joe Biden to bring along a lot of Democrats in South Carolina, and we were. You know, here in 2020, during that election, it was so interesting because all of the Democratic candidates were in and out of South Carolina, which traditionally goes very red. But we didn't have a state Republican primary that year. The state party canceled it. So all of the Democratic candidates were here trying to get people to come into their primary. We have open primaries here. So you don't have to register by party to go vote in a primary. Um, and yeah, Congressman Clyburn definitely gave him the boost that he needed coming out of South Carolina. And I think that's something that the Democratic Party, I would assume, is looking at again when they consider whether it's this race or or upcoming races as well. What does that potentially look like for him um, or for their party in general? And then, of course, on the Republican side, Governor McMaster, our current governor, was one of the first elected officials back in 2016 to come out and then endorse candidate Trump in 2016. And that coalesced the whole state around him at that time. And so seeing those opportunities, knowing that history, it's such an important state for folks for a variety of reasons. But especially knowing that if you win South Carolina, no offense to our colleagues in Iowa and New Hampshire, but South Carolinians don't really care. I mean, they do care, right? But like if you finish in the top three in one of those states and you come here, you still have an opportunity to, to change the trajectory of your campaign. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of candidates now, I think, that are placing all their eggs in Iowa or all their eggs in New Hampshire. We're getting a lot of candidate visits, too, that will continue to increase. But South Carolina, knowing the history that it's had, I would encourage those campaigns to come here uh, more so than going to those two states. Well, and, and you mentioned uh, the Biden race in uh, in this last cycle in 2020, and it was right after South Carolina and the and the win that Joe Biden had in South Carolina that literally within days you saw you know Buttigieg get out mm -hmm. and uh, and so many of the other Democrat candidates just got out. Sanders got out and and. Uh, you know, within days, everybody kind of came around uh, to supporting Joe Biden in the Democratic uh, primary, and that that propelled him on to be the nominee. Um, yeah. Now, now you were raised. You've been raised in South Carolina since you were three years old, right? So, mm -hmm. when did you start kind of paying attention to the presidential primaries and that they were important in the state of South Carolina? This is probably going to sound crazy, Jeff, but I remember in kindergarten that we had like a mock election in kindergarten. That's um, a little crazy. Would, so, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's a little crazy. And I remember and then it wasn't for the primary, more so the general election. It's just, you know, a, a civic exercise at the private school I went to for kindergarten. And you know, so I remember that my um, my dad was a huge like history buff. And so leaning into that. And so it's just something that I mean, I said talk about it a lot at home around the dinner table, but something that we always had the news on. We we're always paying attention. And I just caught like the 
government club bug early in school. So it was kind of always involved. So to counsel all those things all the way through it, in my mind, it's, you know, election, the government's going to go to those who show up. So if you want to make a difference, if you want to have a voice, you know, that's your opportunity to lean in to the primary specifically um, to be able to set that tone for what that general election is going to look like. And especially when it comes to like local races here in South Carolina, right? Like we know folks on the local level truly impact your life on a day-to-day basis more than the presidency does. So getting involved at that level, I think is key. But yeah, go. I can remember, like I said, going all the way back to kindergarten and having like a mock election in our kindergarten classroom and some of my friends being devastated about who won that mock election in our <laughs> kindergarten class. So it's it's kind of been ingrained in me this whole time. That's pretty impressive. I, you know, I, I'm about as political of a, of a person as you can get. I've been involved my whole life, but I don't remember it in kindergarten. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. you, you win that award. When did you realize how unique South Carolina was to the presidential process? I would say probably more so in high school or, or college. Um, I went to um, college at Winthrop University here in South Carolina. And so, you know, both in high school and I would say really starting in third grade and then again in high school, you take a South Carolina history course. So learning the history of South Carolina, learning how unique we are as a state. And part of that is the presidential process and, you know, is taught into that course that you have to that's required in school. And then again, in college of learning like South Carolina 101, you know, and having the opportunity to page at the state house and and just learning, you know, here we were as one of the original colonies, our state capital, we've been from Charleston, Columbia, but then also the presidential process and what that means. For the state, um, we are a very conservative state. Some of that has changed right recently, but a lot of folks have moved here because of lockdowns in their states during COVID. So having that opportunity to just let your voice be heard early and having that opportunity to help set the country, I would say, on the correct trajectory of who the next president should be is something that that is talked about a lot um, in, in those courses is just the importance of the presidency to South Carolina and the history that's there. Do you remember the first vote that you cast in a presidential primary? What what was that like? I do. I would have been a senior in high school the first time I was able to vote in South Carolina. And so thinking about the the primary at that point, you know, and I remember going to I lived out in a rural part of the state, went to a local teeny tiny volunteer fire department to vote. And I think there were like maybe five people there when I was there to vote. It was that tiny. And, you know, and then going home and watching the news that like with my parents of, okay, did my vote make a difference? Did it not? Um, And then again, in college, understanding the importance of, you know, getting involved. Winthrop University is a very politically active school. I would argue the most politically active school in the state as far as making like encouraging their students to get out the vote. Um, And so having that opportunity to lean into professors there And then, you know, have them say like, hey, you can we're going to we're going to be close for Election Day. You can go vote. You should go vote. This is a big part, big opportunity for you um, in the history there. So, yeah, teeny tiny rural fire department where it's like one of those you pull up and you're like, is this the right spot? There's no signs. I'm not really sure. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I kudos to the people who volunteer at the election polls all day because that's something that you've got people coming in and out uh, from all different walks of life, all kinds of crazy questions. Um, that they have. And so having that opportunity um, to lean in there, I think is is tremendous. So you must have some pretty incredible stories, too, because I think not only is South Carolina important, but then you've been involved politically, obviously, throughout the years. So I'm sure that you've got some pretty cool stories. What What's some of your best presidential candidate stories from South Carolina? So I actually worked on a presidential campaign in South Carolina in the 2015-2016 cycle. Um, I worked on um, Jeb Bush's campaign at that at that time. And I remember when his mom came to campaign for him here in South Carolina and just what a tremendous family they were in general, but just what a tremendous individual that she was. And to see her climbing on and off the tour bus, going around the state, meeting with people <laughs> and just, you know, she had done that, of course, for her husband previously, for George W. And then to be here again for another son who's running for office um, and the love that she had to, to do that. Right. And so being able to meet with her, chat with her about just her love for the country um, was just 
you know, I don't know that I realized it at the time necessarily, but just such a tremendous opportunity to have that experience to meet with that family. Um, and then George W. came down to Charleston throughout the first pitch. So that was, you know, kind of cool as well to see to see that at the River Dogs game as they were in the last days of campaigning for, for that particular cycle. And I almost, um, this past election, I was going to vote and was one of the last people to vote at my voting precinct. And they were closing the doors and locking them behind me. And I was like, whew, I made it in just in time because I was like working for AFP and, you know, we were working <laughs> out all day. And I was like, oh, no, I have to run down there and go vote. Um, and I was like, man, made it just in the nick of time. So I think for people in South Carolina who live here who are that involved, it's also making sure you pay attention to that election day cycle to make sure that you get in before those polls close at, at seven o'clock. Well, and you talked about Barbara Bush, uh, Jeb Bush's mother, and she was very authentic. I remember she a- was. meeting her on the campaign trail. I don't even remember what campaign it was. Probably George W. Bush uh, campaign, uh, probably in, uh, you know, uh, maybe as reelect or something. But a truly a unique person, a very down to earth and almost uh, stunning how how kind of down to earth and almost like you're just talking to your grandma a little bit, right? Right. Right. Absolutely. And and I think about that, you know, for a lot of the conversations that we have had at the doors with folks too, of just talking, it's like talking to my grandparents and a lot of these people are home, but yeah, Barbara Bush, just, it's not when you see someone on TV and then you meet them in real life and you're like, that's not what I, at all. I thought that person might, might be like, because it's such in that case, like, you know, you think about the royal family in London and for, for a lot of folks here, they were, you know, were to have multiple people in her family who have been the president of the United States. And then for her to come into South Carolina and just sit down and have a cup of coffee with our team, talk to folks and be willing to like said, get on and off the tour bus all day going around the state. And it's someone who you're like, I don't know if I can match her energy all day long because she was just on the go all the time. And, um, but so down to earth and so genuine and authentic when having conversations with her. You know, I've been in politics a long time and I've met many, actually, I would say most of the people I've met are very much like that. They're just, they're ordinary people. They've just been thrust into a role that, you know, they're running for president or running for the U S Senate or whatever it is. Um, I, I've also met some other people that, that are kind of in it for themselves and you can sure. kind of tell that and, <laughs> mm-hmm. and see, um, but, but it is unique because you see them as people and you get to know them as people rather than just as the candidate. That's kind of a unique feature, uh, isn't it? When you, when you get to, to meet people in that way. It is. And, and again, I think that sometimes our elected officials become so idealized by people of like, oh, well, I see them on TV or all I hear about them is something negative from mainstream media or they didn't vote the way that. But when you have a chance to meet with them in person and you break down some of those barriers that, you know, you might have cast judgment on them because of something that you heard on the news and then you meet them in person and you're like, oh, they are just like me. They're the neighbor next door. They are the person who is, you know, owns their local business and they decided to make a difference and run for office. Or maybe they were talked into it because no one else wanted to do it. Um, that's a lot of the people that I have met. It's it's that's the reason it's maybe they have a higher calling or maybe it's, hey, this seat was vacant and no one wanted to run for it. And people talked me into doing it. Um, but I really you know, want to be able to have make a difference in my community and so having those folks who are so down to earth, I think it's helpful. And again, treating them just like people. And I remember the first time I approached an elected official here about sponsoring a bill for us, I was so nervous about it. And that was something that I had to remind myself of like, okay, he is just a person. And like, there's nothing <laughs> scary about him. He's just a person. I can just, He can say yes or no, but it's not like there's this artificial barrier. I think that we put up when someone becomes an elected official um, that gives us a sense that like we can't approach them when honestly, like they are there to work for us, represent us. And so we should feel like we can approach them no matter the circumstance. Well, and it's so important for people to step up. And uh, we, we talked about that, how, you know, so many times, well, this podcast is about people stepping up and overcoming, mm-hmm. you know, government imposed barriers. And sometimes it's just a citizen who says, you know, there's an injustice on this one issue and they go out and they volunteer their time and they get it changed for, you know, for everybody in their state or everybody in their county or whatever. 
But sometimes it's a little more than that. It's sometimes it's them, a person stepping up and saying, you know what? I'm going to run for office because of this. And we really do need people. You know, it's not enough to complain because this country belongs to all of us. And, and if we want good people in, in politics and in political offices, they have to step up and do that. And, and it's so important for ordinary people, you know, really to just step up and, and do that. Right. Yes, absolutely. And I had someone mention that to me recently. He told me she was interested in running for a state office here. And I asked her why. And she was like, well, I got tired of complaining about it. And I figured I might as well go and do something about it, you know. And so it's having that self-awareness, I think, of like I could yell at the TV all day long. It's not going to make a difference. Just like if I'm yelling at the TV because Clemson's losing to some team, it doesn't make a difference. I'm not on the field actually playing. I'm not the coach. Or just that, you know, and so it's the same, I think, in politics. Like, if you're going to yell at the TV over something, like, then make that decision to step up and, and make that difference. Yeah. Now, uh, we've got obviously the Iowa caucus coming up and then uh, the, the New Hampshire primary. When, what, what is the date of the South Carolina presidential primary? So it is Saturday, February 24th, and it has been on a Saturday um, for for a while now. And I think that's great, honestly, because people have that opportunity where they're already off work. They don't have to. Of course, like your boss has to let you go vote. But a lot of people, I feel like, feel conflicted in asking that sometimes. So like it's it's on a Saturday. The great opportunity actually falls on a national day of action for Americans for Prosperity, which is, I think, great because we're already encouraging people to, to get out and into their primary. Um, so could be, and polls are open from seven to seven. So you've got all day um, to get out there. Okay. Now there have been three Republican presidential debates. There's another one coming up. Um, and, and you have held watch parties at all of these, right? Mm-hmm. And over the debates, have people changed their opinions and what are people saying about the debates and who they feels in the lead and those sorts of things? Yeah, they have. And so when when the debates first started, I think a lot of people were interested in what DeSantis had to say, what Haley had to say, um, what Scott at the time had to say. And then Vivek Ramaswamy was like the shiny new object that people were curious as to like what he was going to say, how he was going to interact with some of these folks on the stage. Um, Haley, a lot of folks felt like Haley won the first debate that we've talked to at the doors. Um, And then similarly for the second of like, Well, there wasn't, you know, a a true winner, but she didn't hurt herself or, you know, DeSantis didn't hurt himself. Now, the debate around the curtain when she was ambassador. Again, some people found that a little cringeworthy moment. Um, But we had someone who attended our last debate watch party in Greenville where we had over 50 people come and he went into it a huge Vivek supporter. And then at the end of it, he said, you know what? Actually, I think I need to look into DeSantis more. I really enjoyed what DeSantis had to say. Um, and so there's people who are starting to tune in. And for for us who are involved in this on a daily basis, Jeff, you know, it feels like, oh, the presidential primary is tomorrow. Right. But for a lot of people, they are just starting to tune in. When we talk to people at the doors, some of them haven't yet paid attention. Um, maybe they've watched the debates, but they're not in it researching the candidates all day, every day like like we are. But people are starting to tune in. They're starting to change their mindset a little bit and they're open to a number of the candidates, for those who haven't solidified their vote yet, they're open to seeing, like, what do these candidates have to say? What does that look like when they come to South Carolina? But in general, we're hearing a lot of Haley and a lot of DeSantis across the state. It, it seems as though it's coming down to DeSantis and Haley, right? Those, those mm-hmm. seem to be the two candidates on the debate stage that that are kind of standing the test of time. And and um, I, I'm interested to see, particularly in South Carolina, when you've got Nikki Haley as a former governor and as a woman, um, you know, the, the comments that Ramaswamy had uh, kind of went after her pretty hard, particularly about her about her daughter. Um, and I was there watching live and the audience really had a strong reaction, a strong negative reaction to him doing that. What was the reaction in South Carolina? Yeah, it was the same one. It's like, okay, well, you're attacking one of our own, right? Because she's a South Carolinian. So there's that automatic kind of defensive mode that goes up. But then two, you know, I think for a lot of South Carolinians, they're not in favor of going after someone's kids. And so whether, you know, it doesn't matter that her daughter is a grown adult, like they're not in favor of that. Keep it between you and the policy that that person stands on. And um, so I'm interested to see how that vote plays out in South Carolina 
The other vote that I've been watching a lot is the evangelical vote. Um, in previous presidential election cycles, whoever can win over that kind of evangelical demographic tends to win the state of South Carolina. And a lot of those folks live in the upstate area near Greenville. And then you've got a very di different demographic of folks who live down in the Charleston area. And so, you know, looking at those opportunities, um, where do those where do those lie and what does that look like for folks who are coming into South Carolina and want to win here? Uh, yeah, I guess final question. It seems like, uh, you know, and I have heard this around the, around the country and in other states that people feel that they're, they're giving a lot more attention to the candidates that are on the debate stage. There are many Republicans who just don't understand why Donald Trump doesn't come to the debates, that he doesn't show up. He's just kind of out there as his own entity. I mean, are you finding that, that people in South Carolina are kind of wondering why he doesn't show up? And I mean, maybe they think it's a little bit disrespectful to not come to voters, debate the issues and ask them for their vote. Yeah, there are folks who have there. There's a both sides of the spectrum there. There's some folks who have said, well, why would he show up? Right. Like, why would he mainstream media is against him? All of these things. But then there's more folks who are like, well, but if he wants our vote again, why isn't he taking the time to come and to talk to us? And so that's something that people are definitely paying attention to because they're able to lean into more what the other candidates have to say um, on these on a variety of issues. You know, when it comes to spending and a lot of folks are, you know, not in favor of big government at all in South Carolina. And then you have that section of Republicans who are like, I'm in favor of big government as long as we're in charge, you know, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so you have those folks who are on both ends of the spectrum. But a lot of people who just see D.C. is so toxic. And frankly, it is. And that trickle down that that toxicity creates into our culture as a whole. We saw a lot of toxicity in our own state government this year um, in, in Columbia. And so I think a lot of the voters that we talk to are ready to move on from that toxicity. And so they're paying more attention to the people who are on the stage um, than the people that aren't. Yeah. Well, Candace, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you sharing your insights. Uh, South Carolina is such an important state, uh, first in the South primary. And uh, boy, I'll bet it's an exciting time being in South Carolina for sure. Yes, it is. Come on and visit anytime, Jeff. We would love to have you um, as we're door knocking and talking to constituents across the state. And thank you for your um, willingness to have me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, coming, Candace. Thank you. Well, listen, I mean, it's it's go time in, in the, the presidential primaries. I mean, we're talking about, you know, just around the corner, the Iowa caucus, uh, the New Hampshire primary, the South Carolina primary, and then from there, Super Tuesday and and all the rest. Uh, it's an important time for our country. And I hope that you will get involved. You will get behind your favorite, uh, your favorite candidate, uh, go out there and vote, make sure that you go out and vote and let your voice be heard. It's all a part of defending this great country that we have and choosing the leadership. And think of all the people around the world who don't get the chance or the choice to, or the voice to, to pick their leader. Liberty and freedom, they're easily taken for granted. Don't ever take liberty and freedom for granted. Go out there, defend freedom, defend liberty. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.